Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Yes, please. Hi, everyone. Turn your cameras on. That's nice. Hi, Keith. Hello, Gabby. <laughs> Okay, I got it. Let me just see the wrong one. Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. No, you are not. Hi. 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 Uh, there will be more joining. We have quite some people signing up, so I, I guess in the coming minutes, uh, many more will join. Um, welcome uh, to the session on rules of engagement. Um, as you know, online education comes with uh, challenges of engagement, and uh, we are looking into, yeah, what approaches, what technologies are are there. Uh, some good examples on that on um, stimulate uh, further engagement of, of the students. For today, um, we want to start with uh, the focus on um, the learning design. And uh, for this, we have um, invited uh, some expert speakers coming from the OUK. That's Karen Keir and John Roswell. And also Gabby Withouse from the University of Birmingham and UCL. And we wanted to start with uh, Karen and, um, and John on active participation and synchronous online learning. Please. John or Karen, the floor is yours. Okay, well, I'll say welcome. And um, I'll just share my screen, hopefully, so you can see the slides. Um, hello from me also. Nice to see people here today. We can hear you well, and the PowerPoint is working well as well. Good, <laughs> right. In that case, we're off. Um, so just to say uh, that Karen and I be presenting today, Helen unfortunately can't make it today. This is a project that had uh, a lot of other people from other parts of the university. Uh, so it represents a kind of a broad spread of subjects. Um, and we're talking about uh, active participation. And particularly we're talking about tutorials. So just to make the point that we're not talking about uh, lectures. So are you teaching traditionally in over 50 years? has not used lectures, um, but it always has used small group teaching uh, in the shape of, shape of tutorial. That used to be face to face. And for about nine years now, there's been a policy that every tutorial event is offered both face to face and online. Uh, but because of COVID, that's effectively gone fully online. and We've not really gone back to face to face teaching. So it's a core part of our teaching. But there is a concern that there's uh, some students don't own up at all, and then the ones that do are not as active as uh, we would like. So we're looking at uh, the questions down at the bottom there. What factors are affecting student engagement? Um, we did think that there may be differences across faculties. I'm not going to be reporting on that and generally found that the, the differences aren't don't seem to be particularly driven by the subject. Um, and then, of course, the golden question, uh, how can we address the challenges? Um, I'm talking about Adobe Connect. Uh, Adobe Connect is a, you may not know, it's a, another product like Teams or uh, Zoom. Um, actually, it's been around for a long time. The OU has used it for a long time. It has probably more features than either Teams or, or Zoom. I think that's fair to say. It has a rather clunkier interface. Um, so kind of like this, but uh, a little bit different. Lots of features you can, and you can use it in quite elaborate ways. Um, uh, what happened there? I've lost my power, my slideshow. Right, um, I'm hoping you're looking at a slide that says research methods. Um, we're talking about essentially the survey uh, that we did. Uh, we did two surveys, actually one for students and one for tutors on uh, matching uh, courses. We chose students in the middle of their degree, so they had some experience uh, of tutorials, should have done, and we went right across the university. Um, similar questions to both surveys, produced a lot of quantitative data and qualitative, good size samples, but actually the response rate was relatively low from students. So you might uh, be aware that 
this may not be uh, representative of all students. We did focus groups. I'm not going to talk about those today. And the questions were what sort of activities um, do students participate? And if they don't, why is it? That's what we were trying to get at. So straight into some results. Uh, have you attended online uh, tutorials for this module? Um, and of the ones who responded, then yes, uh, a good uh, proportion had done. Um, some were saying no, either because they knew what tutorials were like and didn't find them helpful, or that um, they might have preferred to use a recording instead. And if you ask them why, then uh, on the right hand side, you can see a couple of obvious academic things that help me prepare for my assessment. It will help me progress in the module. And actually, the last couple of things as well are specific academic things. I had a question to ask. I needed help. But in between, there are some more sort of slightly social things. I want to meet other students. I want to meet my tutor. And I thought it'd be interesting and enjoyable. So um, you have to recognize that tutorial uh, there are reasons why students should be active if they want to meet people and um, and so on. They need to be a little bit active. It's not a passive uh, event. But if you start asking students about how they feel about it, you quite quickly see that there are um, concerns and anxieties. So if you ask them beforehand how they feel, then there is a noticeable proportion that will say they feel anxious about it. And even the ones that uh, are, are looking forward to it, often they reveal in a comment like the one there that uh, I like it, but that's because I don't have to speak. You know, So there's sort of a hidden uh, anxiety, I think, for, for many students that, that comes up uh, about tutorial. They attended, uh, generally the answer to that is yes, but they're sometimes disappointed, um, either that they didn't get what they really wanted particularly help with the assignment. That seems to be the a driver. Um, and uh, and sometimes other reasons as well. There's quite a rich uh, set of reasons coming out. And if you ask them in, in the comments, you can see some of those uh, comments coming through. Sometimes they're about practical things, about um, timetabling, I couldn't make it. Um, and so the recordings are therefore useful for that. Um, sometimes it's about the purpose, about help with assessment or whatever. Um, and there are some things about uh, the tutors, about the style of the tutors, some very positive comments and actually some negative ones as well. Um, and there are some things about discussion, again, both positive and negative things. These, these are the things that might be the more active uh, aspects of a tutorial. If you ask uh, whether they were given opportunities to participate actively, uh, then the answer to that is a resounding yes, at least in most uh, tutorials. Whether you ask them, sorry, if you ask them whether they took part, it's rather less positive. So um, some are taking part quite a lot, some a little, and there are, um, uh, again, a noticeable minority that are not really taking part at all. And if you dig into that a little bit diff, uh, more detail, you won't be surprised to see there's an association. So the ones who are looking forward to it are also the ones who are taking part. The ones who are anxious are more likely to be the ones who don't really take part or, or don't take part at all. Um, so there is a some issue there about anxiety, which may be affecting uh, students' uh, participation with it. Karen, over to you now, I think. Thank, thank you, John. Um, so we asked quite a lot of different kinds of questions in, in these uh, surveys that we did. And this one is talking about what kinds of activities are the tutors offering in the tutorials? So you can see there's some quite generic type of things like answering questions and asking questions that can be done. And then there's some quite specifics like then they might be offered a poll or a quiz, uh, there might be breakout rooms and, and generally sort of practicing some um, subject related skills like programming is, is a, an example from our own field. And then uh, maybe typing something into a whiteboard or, or drawing some diagrams. So lots of different kinds of activities using the tools that are on offer in, in that online environment. Thanks, John, the next one.
And then we asked why for those students who did not participate actively, or at least not so much, uh, what were their reasons for that? And we offered lots of different possible reasons and you can, you can see them here. And on all these slides, we've got responses both from students in the orange color and from tutors in the blue color. So the tutors are kind of speculating really on, on what they think from their own experience and knowledge um, the, the students' reasons are. Um, but just focusing on the orange ones, the, the order here is, is order by pro pro proportion of students, really. So at the top, you've got, I'm, I'm fine with just listening, which is a kind of a, a generic response, really. And then as you, as you go down, you can probably see that quite a lot of them are about confidence or anxiety so we've got the word nervous there we've got worried um and then associated things like they, they're a little bit behind in what they're studying they don't think they've got anything to contribute so a lot of these are related to lack of confidence is our, our generic conclusion about this and the confidence mainly is in relation to what other students might might think about them so that's the third one down which is really quite significant and then the other thing you can pick up from this slide, if you go down to the bottom a bit, is that there are certain um, more technical reasons which are really not coming out very strongly from the students at all, even though the tutors think they might be important. Um, but um, the students are, are fine with you know, running the system, really, um, but not with the kind of more what you might describe as more psychological aspects of it. Thanks, John. Next one. So following that up a little bit, we did ask uh, whether the students felt stressed in tutorials when they were expected to take part more actively. And, and on the whole, they sort of did and didn't really from the students, again in the orange here. Um, the tutor's perspective was, was much more that the students were um, stressed. So we're beginning to see a difference, well, we've already seen a difference between the tutor's views of what's going on and the students' views of, of what's going on. But there is something around confidence. So um, a third of students felt stressed. It's quite a lot, really. And then there's a little quote from a student, a student at the bottom there. OK, John, thanks. We were interested to know whether the students were preferring to use the tap text chat facility rather than using the microphone to speak, because that's what we'd heard from, from tutors. And on the whole, that is the case. Um, so again, that's coming out fairly strongly from the students in orange and very strongly from the ideas of the tutors in blue. And again, you've got a couple of quotes here, both from students. OK, John, thanks. And then going into this tool use a little bit more deeply here. So. Um, Here's some data on what, what kind of tools the students are using. So again, the text chat is coming quite strongly out is the highest one. Um, and then we've got other things like the whiteboard and the polls and reactions, which means, you know, putting your thumbs up or smiley face or something like that. Uh, pretty little use of microphone at 11% and barely any use of the, of the webcam. Um, and then there's another couple of quotes from students again there explaining why they prefer to use text chat. Thanks, John. So we wanted to look a little bit about, about webcams, but not too much because we, we knew that there wasn't a great deal of use of webcams at the OU and we wanted to find <clears throat> out a bit about that. Um, but anyway, so we said, if, if you were invited to use the webcam, would you be willing to do that? Um, and 30% of students said they would feel comfortable using a webcam. Um, but again, the, the tutor's view was a bit different. And then again, you've got some quotes in the yellow from the students and in the blue from one of the tutors. Explaining a bit about the reason why they might not use them. OK, John, thanks. So drawing all of that together a little bit, we're, we're looking at here passive attendance versus active participation. And again, you've got some quotations from the open text fields in the survey, the yellow ones from students explaining what their perspective is, 
and the blue one from a from a tutor explaining how they approach it so that they help the students to feel more comfortable in, in the online environment. And then at the bottom, you've got a couple of comments from students about recordings. So many or most of the tutorials are recorded and some students prefer to watch them later rather than to join in live at the time. Thanks, John. So we wanted to know whether students thought there was benefit in participating actively and on the whole they did. Again, the orange here shows the students agreements, uh, not quite as strong as the tutors agreements about the value of active participation, but nevertheless, um, on the whole, they, they did agree. So that, that's quite encouraging that the students think it's worthwhile. So the question then is how do we encourage that without increasing the stress levels on the students? And that's voiced at the bottom from an actual student. So wanting more encouragement to be to be joining in. Thank you, John. I think over to you now, John, isn't it? OK, yeah. Um, just here, uh, if you ask uh, students following up about uh, which activities they find valuable, uh, sometimes there are things about um, questions and help. Uh, but actually, there are comments there about communication and kind of discussion and so on, which imply that they they understand that they should be uh, kind of active uh, in these tutorials. So the comments are, are quite rich uh, in, in picking those things out. Um, one set of questions we, we asked uh, were a series of Likert scales. So these... Uh, Items are things like I enjoy tutorials where I take actively take part. I feel confident. Uh, I think there's a benefit to me. I feel stressed, um, and so on. The point really about this is that if you look at the um, pattern that you get there, there is no consensus among students. Nearly all of those scales that you ask students, you'll find very similar proportions coming out with agreement and disagreement. Um, so that kind of implies that there isn't a typical student that you can design for and produce one event that will satisfy everyone. That's not going to be the case. Uh, students are very varied in their views. Um, and so that is, a, I think, an issue that we all need to, to think about quite seriously. So just to summarise then uh, the last few slides, um, really to say that many students do enjoy participation and, and a lot of them do think it's beneficial, uh, but clearly there are some that are finding it stressful. Uh, they may not be uh, confident in their knowledge, they may be behind and that gives them one reason, but this issue that uh, Karen has already pointed out, that they're worried about what other students or the tutor may think of them uh, seems to be a big barrier. And many of them therefore say that they're happy just to, to watch and listen. So they come to the tutorial with a, a fairly passive uh, mindset. The tutors uh, definitely think that interaction is helpful for students and for tutors. The experience of giving a, a tutorial is much richer if uh, you get some feedback. And tutors, however, they do understand there's a limitation of online specifically interactions. And so therefore they're willing to allow that students have some benefit uh, to uh, participating, at least anonymously, which does seem to be one of the things that defuses the, the tension slightly. So final recommendations um, to allow for this wide range of student preference, not to try and force students to participate. But on the other hand, we have, should be trying to persuade students of the value of uh, participation and providing them with ways to get the confidence to do that. And one aspect of that might be um, yeah, just to help them understand how meetings should run and, and so on and try and stress the value uh, of interaction. And a very specific thing is about uh, how to manage a discussion so that uh, individuals don't dominate. So that's an aspect that comes up in student comments. Either they, that they felt that somebody has dominated or they are worried that they might dominate so it works both ways um, and so we should provide activities to help students develop uh, confidence 
and maybe do that in sort of icebreakery away from the academic, um, strongly academic aspect. Um, and to offer ways of participating, particularly the anonymous ones. Some uh, tips at the bottom there, which uh, could be useful. And to say, thank you very much. Uh, we're open uh, to take questions. Uh, and um, and if there aren't any questions, I'll leave some up on uh, for my own. So if you have any answers as well, uh, interested to hear those. So Stefan, over to you too. Yeah, Matteo, thanks so much, uh, John and Karen. It was very, very clear and 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 on topic. And uh, normally you would hear a big applause, but everybody's applauding uh, um, to a muted uh, microphone. Uh, any anyone uh, questions for John and, and Karen? Uh, can we see a hand? Otherwise, I myself have a question. You can also use the chat if you like. Uh, that's also fine. Um, I'm going to stop sharing the screen so that sure. I can see yep. the, the chat. Um, Let me kick off with a question there, um, John and Karen. I have um, uh, something I have a feeling when, uh, isn't it a kind of culture of learning that has um, uh, established itself? Because when you as a student enter, enter a room where everybody has already the cameras off, you probably will not put the camera on. Or if this is a culture of learning that maybe should be changed by, by uh, uh, maybe a, another introduction to how to uh, learn online or so. I don't know if there's thoughts about that. Uh... I can feel that one. <clears throat> I've been thinking about this quite a lot because um, John and I work in the IT as a, as a trade. And I think the idea of a default is really important, actually. Um, so systems have defaults and, and also people have cultures and protocols, social protocols, as, as well as the sort of technical protocols. So um, what happens in these sort of online meetings does influence what people do and particularly, obviously, what students do. So I think you're absolutely right, George, to, to point this out. Uh, the question is, what, what do you actually do about it? So I've noticed that some of the meetings that I take part in um, everybody has their cameras on and some of them they don't and we've discussed this quite a lot and we've got a bit of a small research project about it um, so I, I think it does matter and um, we probably need to do some education of what well, we've already thought about doing education for the tutors and obviously that happens already but doing some sort of education for the students um, so that they get the idea that you know it, it it does matter what, what they do and how they do it, um, which isn't obvious, actually. It may be obvious to us because we're, we're in the trade already, but possibly not to new students. No, I guess they would learn so much more by active participation. And uh, yeah, if they don't feel the environment is safe enough in the sense that no other students are visible or taking the floor, then it's uh, yeah, people yeah. adapt to what they see. Yeah, and, and they, they don't necessarily know the other students. They certainly don't know them in the face-to-face -face way. They may not even have ever come across them before. Yeah. yeah. On the other hand, it could also be that people are more anonymous and dare to ask questions that they normally, in a room full of people, do, would not dare to ask. That is possible. And certainly that idea of anonymity of tools like the whiteboard and the polls came out really, really strongly in, in the answers that we got from the students. Yeah. Would uh, not recording a session help with actively participating by students? As Elon asks this in the chat, and I can tell you this session will be recorded, but <laughs> don't be afraid to ask questions. But uh, John, yeah. do you want to field that one? Um, it, it's it's certainly a possibility, and it's a concern. And uh, so the university policy at the moment is that if a tutorial is offered in a, a particular topic that um, because large courses there will be a number of repetitions of essentially the same tutorial so the policy at the moment at least one of those must be recorded and at least one of those should not be recorded and that's particularly to give uh, students the choice of which one uh, they choose to go to um you can see possibly from comments that, that some students are reticent because of recording but actually in, in we didn't delve in it uh, in a lot of detail, but um, one of the reasons that we gave um, was about recording and it didn't figure strongly in, in our survey. Uh, 
Yeah. Um, you have to remember that the because of the low response rate, that the our responses might not be completely representative, and particularly of the students who are the ones who don't choose to go to tutorials at all. They may never have come to this survey, uh, so we do have a problem about the representation. But yeah, recording is possibly an issue. At the moment, the tool that we use anonymizes most things, but not completely. Um, so names do appear in the chat at the moment. That's becoming uh, fully anonymous. Uh, but of course, webcam on, um, it, you kind of lose a bit of an anonymity then anyway, or at least people perceive it that way. But certainly, as John pointed out, in our list of reasons, the fact that the uh, uh, tutorial was being recorded was pretty low. It was about two thirds of the way down. So even though this has been a very, very big debate over you know, last five years at, at the Open University, uh, it doesn't seem as though it's it's a big issue at the moment. Thanks. Uh, any any other questions? Then this is the moment. I don't know. Then I would like to. Yeah. I've got a question. Um, I'm just wondering this thing about anonymity. Is there a case to argue that maybe we should be trying to encourage students to take ownership of their comments, their views, their mistakes, and to create an environment that is open and accepting of mistakes if students do make mistakes? Because the more we move towards trying to provide anonymity as the default, the more we move away from a kind of human approach to learning together. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. Um, I think we're, it feels like we're well away from that point where we could do that good thing. Um, and I think we, th we need to find a way of getting from where we are to, to that place. And I think it's a long journey. So getting the students to feel comfortable. I mean, my research over many years has been about online community. And all of all of that work has shown that, that we're a long way away from being able to enable online community. And I think, to be honest, at the OU, we might have moved a little bit backwards in that lately because we're giving a lot more flexibility of, to time for students, which is really good for our learners because they're all in jobs and everything. But it does mean that they're less likely to meet the same students every time and they, they don't meet them, meet them very often and that kind of thing. So I think to build that sense of community and that sense of comfort, um, it does require people to feel that they know each other a bit. And I don't think they do. John, do you want to chip in? Um, yeah, I, I echo those things. Um, and also, this we're talking here particularly about synchronous um, meetings, but the same thing I think is true in forums, uh, over, you know, which have been a, a large learning space at the OU for many years. Um, and at the moment, those are, well, they are not anonymized. You, you're there present. And I think that students, I think, sometimes feel particularly exposure to to staff in those environments um and so i get the sense that you know for example whatsapp groups and so on like that are popular because they're seen as being not anonymous but but away from the gaze of the staff sort of thing and so that's a sort of another dimension to that uh, anonymity um yeah yeah, thanks so much. Uh, thanks again, uh, John and Karen. Um, I think there was also a raised hand from Keith before. I don't know if the question has already answered, Keith, or uh, uh, if it's still... In, in part, thank you very much for the opportunity. What what I'm... I come from a business school background, so only part of the OU uh, and distance learning setting. But one of the things, and I know it happens in other disciplines too, is that our students are being prepared with various skills to use them in the workplace. And I know a lot of OU students will have work already, but this method of communicating, as Gabby said, it's, it's not human, you know, and we perhaps need to make it a more accepted and more um, accessible form of communication. So that's yet another task for tutors in universities is to develop these skills through the curriculum so that that our, our students graduate to be able to have meetings online, you know, and effective meetings. I think that's what it is. Everyone can have a meeting, but make it effective. 
I know, I know that's not a question, it, it's more of a comment, but um, one of the, you know, logical argument and teenagers is probably something we, we can leave to another day, but it's, you know, do, does the OU, do you try and persuade or encourage students to participate because they're developing these new skills? I mean, I, I think I can jump in and say, uh, yes, I think that is an important role of tutorials amongst many others. Um, but also to point out that there are at least some students who come to the OU uh, because they have, you know, recognised mental health issues that mean that they're not willing to do that sort of thing. So uh, we also have to balance that, those sort of individual needs um, as well as trying to encourage people, as you say, to develop skills that we see as important, graduate skills, 21st century skills and so on. So it's a difficult balancing act uh, to uh, to deal with both ends of that spectrum. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll just chip in something as well. Um, we do focus and always have done on, on developing um, what they're called employability skills these days, but you know, um, and that, and that is absolutely a key one. Um, so I think the students are aware of that as well. The other thing I think I'd point out in relation to that, though, is that the tutorial or any educational type um, event is quite different from like a work meeting. Um, so I think we have to be careful about how we research these two things and how how we you know try to develop these two things, um, but yeah giving you know being confident in the work context maybe our, I'm, I'm guessing our students are pretty confident in the work context because they you know they've done it for a long time and they know what they're doing um but that might be quite different from feeling confident in a in an educational context so i suspect there's something like that going on as well yeah yeah thanks so much uh john and can we go now deeper into the um to the topic with uh, gabby withhouse uh, she will talk about the overcoming overcoming barriers to online engagement through careful learning design and delivery. Right. Thank you. Um, so my talk is based on my PhD research that I've been doing over the last few years. And um, it was in the context of, um, oh, sorry, let me... There we go. It was in the context of refugees and asylum seekers who were learning online. They were master's students through a UK university um, in a program on um, international relations and politics. Uh, so I'd like to first of all make the case for why I'm, I'm transferring these findings to a wider grouping of um, online students. Um, there are many ways in which refugees and asylum seekers are characterized as being sometimes a bit different from other parts of the student body. Um, and those ways can all be challenged. So one of them is that um, for most asylum seekers and refugees and displaced people, they have experienced trauma or they are experiencing trauma. However, trauma is also prevalent in the wider population. And in fact, in one North American study, which was a literature review, um, online higher education students were found to have experienced trauma in high numbers, 60 to 80%. Um, digital poverty is another element that is commonly associated with refugees and asylum seekers. However, Laura Cherniovics reminds us, citing figures from the World Bank, that almost 800 people in developing countries have no access to electricity. 2.6 billion do not have access to continuous electricity, and that's before you even factor in internet connectivity. Um, and then another key characteristic of the demographics of um, displaced learners is heterogeneity. Almost every study you read um, in that literature points that out. However, it's also been identified, and I think John actually mentioned it earlier as well, as being, um, you know, our students have very diverse ways of learning and approaches to being online learners. Um, and this is Kyung Mi Lee in 2017 who noted that um, it, 
heterogeneity is a key characteristic of online learners in the general student population. So there is a need for a holistic support model that can support and serve all students. So I framed my study in the capability approach, which is a social justice conceptual framework, first put forward by Amartya Sen in 1979. This is a more recent picture of him. He's in his 90s now, still um, speaking and writing about capabilities. And he put forward the idea that capabilities are the freedom to do and be what one has reason to value doing and being. Um, so it's a much wider conception of capabilities than the way we use the term in everyday language. He's a philosopher and an economist, by the way. Martha Nussbaum, who's also a philosopher and a legal scholar, she took the capabilities approach in a slightly different direction. She said, well, for democratic societies to properly serve their, um, their citizens and people, they need to ensure that a threshold level of these 10 core capabilities is reached for everyone. And they're quite basic. It's like the capability for life, bodily health, bodily integrity. We start getting into thinking about education with senses, imagination and thought, emotions. Her term practical reason has often been associated with the concept of agency because it's the idea of conceptualizing a good life for oneself, planning for it and acting on that. Affiliation is all about social participation. She talks a lot about other species and humans' relationships and the importance of harmony between us and other species. She talks about play and control over one's environment. Um, so this might all seem quite far away from higher education, but I'm going to bring it back to that. Um, her basic premise was that to enable people to live lives worthy of dignity, governments must provide at least a threshold level of the core capabilities. And I'm sure you'll see that it's not only dignity that is served by that, but also equity between different individuals. Um, Melanie Walker is one of the most prolific scholars in the capabilities field who has taken these ideas into higher education. She worked with Martha Nussbaum's list in 2006 and came up with a list, she called it an ideal theoretical list um, of capabilities needed for participation in higher education. Some of them overlap with Martha Nussbaum's, as you see, number two, educational resilience was one she added. I'm not going to go into those in detail now, but that's just to say these form the theoretical underpinning of my work. And I've written elsewhere about how these then mapped onto the capabilities needed for online engagement. Um, so just to sum up this concept of capabilities, capabilities include both skills and abilities that can be learned and practiced, which is usually the, the way we use the word in everyday language, and also freedoms that are socially or environmentally or politically shaped. Um, I've chosen this picture here of women in Saudi Arabia on bicycles from 2017. And if I ask you, do these women have the capability to ride a bike? You might say, well, they look well balanced on their bikes. They look confident. They look, uh, yeah, I'm sure they're capable. But um, in the article that was associated with this picture, it said that um, women are only allowed to ride bicycles on the beach or in parks and only with a male guardian in Saudi Arabia. And therefore, at that time, I don't know if it's still the case today, but at that time, you couldn't truly say that women had the capability fully to ride a bicycle. They, they weren't allowed to ride a bicycle as a means of transport, for example. So bringing this um, back to Martha Nussbaum, she used these terms, in, internal capabilities for the things that we as individuals can learn and practice. And that was back to her list of 10 again. And once those things are also enabled through social and political structures, she called them combined capabilities. And that's what she felt that all governments should be aiming for. And by extension in higher education with Melanie Walker's list, what we're aiming for as well. So what I found in my research um, was that the capabilities that are needed for online engagement 
while they included both personal skills and abilities that can be developed and practiced, and freedoms that are socially, politically, and economically enabled, it was the latter that mattered somehow, that had a greater impact on people, students' ability to continue engaging in their courses. Um, here is one of my research participants. Um, he is the pseudonym Julian. He is in a refugee camp in Malawi. There he's drawing water from the local well. Just to give you an idea of the environment in which he completed an online postgraduate certificate in um, politics and international relations. He had no electricity in his home, but he had access to an office with um, shared, with electricity and Wi-Fi and shared space that he could use from time to time. So um, I'm going to bring this now closer to ideas that are more familiar within um, online higher education. And this is what I call the 4D, four-dimensional online engagement framework. Um, adapted from Patria Redmond et al. 2018, who had a five element framework. Um, but basically the, the dimensions that are most commonly discussed in the literature about engagement are emotional, behavioral, social and collaborative and cognitive. And I'm gonna look at each one of these in turn, in terms of both the constraints for the people that I interviewed and um, in each case, a recommendation. So emotional engagement, this, it was very interesting listening to John and Karen earlier because I saw a lot of resonance between what you were saying and what I'm saying here as well. Emotional engagement is the ability to engage with a positive attitude, to feel motivated about your studies, basically. Um, and the for the students that I spoke to, um, there were many constraints in this area. There was fear and anxiety often associated to one's asylum status or circumstances. Um, there was trauma, sometimes in the past and sometimes continuing. Um, and there was, um, yeah, th th there were worries about finances, about food, about accommodation and so on. So the one thing that I would really recommend in that regard is if you want to foster, foster emotional engagement is to be trauma aware. There's a whole new body of literature emerging on this. Well, there's an established body as well, but it's being, um, I think more people are looking into it now than ever before. And to be trauma aware means things like um, being aware of potential trauma triggers for your students, not asking questions, direct questions about people's experience that could re-trigger trauma. It means um, setting a supportive space, a supportive environment for peer communication. And it means communicating with students in, a, this is to use a term from Sally Baker, a warm way. Um, if a student reaches out to you by email and asks you a question about what the dissertation requirements are or something, um, the standard answer is very often, oh, you'll find that in the student handbook. Um, but for some students, it was incredibly meaningful when they got even just a very short but kind email back from their um, from their teacher. So moving on to behavioral engagement, behavioral engagement is about doing the work, fulfilling the requirements of the course, participating in the forums where they had to participate. This course, by the way, was all asynchronous. So I think it provides a nice kind of, um, it resonates a lot with the synchronous um, context that John and Karen were talking about. And, um, but for various reasons, and the fact that some of the students were in war zones was a major reason, they kept it absolutely asynchronous and all communication happened via discussion forum. So the constraints for students in my study to participate, to behave, behaviorally engage, were around um, what is often called life load. And life load is the sum of all the pressures in a person's life outside of their studies if they're a student. So it's family commitments, it's work commitments, it's commuting to work, 
Um, in the case of some of my participants, it was also navigating a very complicated and bureaucratic and often hostile um, asylum system. So those constraints meant that um, what people needed most was flexibility. And my key recommendation here is that to foster behavioral engagement, the more flexibility you can provide, the better. And that's things like when students um, request an extension of a deadline for an assignment, for example, um, going back to emotional um, engagement, not asking for absolutely detailed explanations of why they need it because they could be in a state of trauma that they would have to then disclose. Um, keeping the procedures simple and straightforward and um, ensuring that students can actually get those extensions when they need them, providing opportunities for breaks if students need between modules, and in fact, um, the emergence of stackable micro-credentials in higher education, I think, is a good step in that direction, because that would um, give people whose lives are in turmoil but still want to do an online program, would give them the opportunity to do that. Um, so moving on to social and collaborative engagement, this is basically the engagement dimension that says um, that people learn often, not always, but often learn better when trying to collaboratively construct knowledge with their peers or with other people than independently. Um, the constraints that I found here, and if you remember, I'm specifically perhaps overemphasizing constraints linked to those social and political and economic freedoms rather than personal skills, um, but they did mesh and overlap a lot. Um, what I found here was that some of the students um, were anxious um, about being treated with hostility because of previous experiences they'd had um, and because of characteristics, intersectional characteristics of gender, race, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation and so on. Um, and because people had learned to protect themselves from such hostility, they it was more difficult for them to feel they could trust within this, this group. Um, the students often, I, could, I gathered from them, they were longing for recognition and respect and a kind of mutual engagement within the forums, which was the only place, the, the only opportunity for that. But they often held back um, because of their anxiety. Um, again, I think this picks up on what was said in the earlier session, but to foster social and collaborative engagement, my key recommendation here is to support students to think together respectfully. Students often in online learning haven't had much experience at all of discussion forums, for example, or if they have, they've seen um, they've seen unpleasant forums online where people have been, you know, have insulted others and so on. So it's about creating, perhaps setting ground rules collaboratively with the students at the start of the module. Um, it's about modeling um, how you want students to engage on that forum through the posts that you post yourself and the way you respond to students. It's about being sensitive in your moderation of the discussion between students. Um, it's not about reaching consensus or having debates or any of those things. It's about providing a culture, an environment where students um, learn to think together respectfully. Um, then finally, cognitive engagement is, um, I think it's the one that many uh, higher education academics really value the most because after all, what do students come to university for if not to learn to think critically and to uh, gain new disciplinary knowledge and so on. Um, the constraints for students in my study, again, for me, there was a, they were very closely tied to the emotional engagement because people were worried 
to engage cognitively, to express their views or their emerging understanding. Again, as the previous speaker said, partly because they were worried they might be wrong, they might make mistakes, but also because they were worried that their emerging understanding might have been informed by their previous life experience in Afghanistan, for example, or a culture where um, universities in the West tend to have a narrative that clearly defines a right side and a wrong side, and they might have seen that as much more grey. So I found students sometimes censoring themselves and not engaging cognitively, trying to figure out the rules of the game and to play the game intellectually, rather than doing what they really wanted to do, which was engage deeply and authentically with the intellectual challenges of the course. So my recommendation here is to provide safe spaces for active inquiry. This is similar to the um, accountable spaces that I mentioned earlier, the supporting students to think together. But um, it's also about the way the tutor or the marker responds to the students in the feedback they give. And, um, and yeah, and the way they make students feel safe um, online. Uh, so this is my conclusion. I, one of the most striking findings was that engagement fuels engagement. So I found, for example, that if something suddenly clicked for a learner and they engaged emotionally, that would fuel um, a, a whole sort of domino effect of behavioral engagement, cognitive engagement, social and collaborative engagement. Not always, all, all of them, but quite often it would fuel at least one other form of engagement. And so it doesn't matter which point in this quadrant you start at, if you support students to engage in one dimension, at least it's very likely to help them in the other dimensions. So this is my um, conclusion, and I've called it a careful approach to the design and delivery of online higher education, because I think we talk a lot about a pedagogy of care now. Uh, and these four recommendations I've made, I think, are part of a pedagogy of care for both design and delivery. There's some references there. There's a QR code there, which should take you to my Google Slides if you want to see them. Um, and that's that's it. Thanks, Karen. Carrie, on, 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 the, on, the, on the thanks so much uh, for presenting this. Again, I hear people cheering, but they are all muted. Uh, <laughs> thanks. And any questions there? Um, I get, I get this, this this picture there for, for myself, like a church where everybody's listening. And another church where there's gospel, where everybody's participating, uh, like that. <laughs> and um, they're both engaged, but in a different way, of course. Um, anyway, anyway, so actually, uh, Gabby, you, you are, you're referring also to the to the the teachers' professors' uh, obligation there to um, keep in mind that uh, um, uh, that the engagement is affected uh, often by the personal background of of, of students. Um, do you think uh, teachers are in the learning design at this moment um, actively considering considering all this because there's there's more also to inclusiveness uh, about people like um, with dyslexia or so there are so many things to think about when you are um, uh, in uh, in course design. Uh, do you think teachers are aware of all these different groups uh, that need to be engaged? Well, I think that's a really difficult one, George. I think there is certainly an increasing awareness and an increasing desire amongst the um, teachers and academics that I work with to be more inclusive. And the, the difficulty really is thinking, well, what does that mean? Because as um, I've said and the other speakers today have said, there is such diversity amongst the student body that you just can't account for every possible need or, or difference. Um, but I think what I learned through this study was that um, we do tend to often focus on those that side of the capabilities, which is the personal skills and abilities that can be learned, because we think, okay, um, what can we, how can we help this student 
improve their skills as an individual. But on the other side of the capabilities um, concept is those socially and politically and economically shaped freedoms, which are so far outside of our control, all the control of our students most of the time, that it's, yeah, we I think we, we just don't want to go there because it's too difficult. Um, so I think what I found was that many for many of the students, they internalized a lot of what was happening for them in the outside. And it came out emotionally and it came out in the way they engaged socially. And I know in online learning we've had a we have a long tradition of understanding the importance of social engagement. But I'll yeah, I'll give just one example there about how how closely intertwined social and emotional engagement are. I had one participant who said to me, right in our first interview, she said, Gabby, I don't want to waste my time going into the discussion forum, she said, because uh, it was optional. She said, I just want to do what's important to get the degree. Um, and she's a master's student, and um, and I knew she I could have a, a sort of an academic discussion with her about it. So I said, you know what? Um, in my professional experience and understanding of online learning, um, there's actually a lot of evidence to show that people benefit a lot from the social part of the of the course. So it's worth it's worth a try. Why don't you give it a try? She was she was not only um, worried about wasting her time. She was also she suffered from depression and various um, yeah trauma. Also all the stuff that I talked about earlier. Anyway, the next time I met her, she said, "Guess what, Gabby? I went into the discussion forum and she said, and I was so excited to see all my classmates. They they're all in, incredibly impressive people. They work for NATO. They work for." Um, you know, the United Nations, they're doing such important work around the world. And I thought, yay, she's, you know, now she's motivated to go in. But the next thing she said was, um, and I felt like I was nothing. Okay. And I just, and and then it took her, she didn't go into the forum then, she did later. But she had to get over her own sense of inadequacy, uh, inadequacy in comparison to the perceived superiority of her peers and so it's not just about you know saying well you know people will benefit if they just get over their reluctance to participate in the forum there's so much it's so much more complicated than that I don't know I'm sure John and Karen will have things to say about that from their research as well yep. <laughs> not Does to put look? you on the spot or anything <laughs> yeah I'll, I'll dip in I mean yeah it sounds I was really struck, Gabby, by how, you know, you're talking about people with particular experiences, or at least a lot of them have. Um, but if you kind of draw draw that back to your average distance learning student with the people that we're talking about, the, the issues are the same, really. So there might be reasons why your your students have got particular, you know, things that have happened to them that have reduced their confidence but other things are happening to all students or have already happened to all students, which means they don't start with much confidence. For example, they haven't had a good experience at school. They haven't got equivalent qualifications to other people. And I'm thinking of that person that you just described. You know, she doesn't know that everybody else is cleverer than her, but she thinks they are. And, and I think that's what's going on. And I think part of the problem is that our students, they never get to see other people's work or to hear about other students' work. So they've got a vision of the other students as being some kind of elite, you know, who are much better than them, more confident than them, cleverer than them. Um, and I, I think we need to find ways to, to address that. So we have tried that, actually, where we've, um, I mean, John, you, the modules you've worked on, we've tried to share work so that um, people can see the, the kind of stuff that other people are doing and realise it's not, you know, it's not so far, far above what they themselves can do. John, do you have anything to add to that? No, not really. I mean, um, I keep thinking about icebreakers and finding places where everyone is <clears throat> equally disadvantaged. That, that That's a kind of a leveller. And uh, that resonates with the, the idea of taking things away from the kind of more academic environment 
and so on. Um, I've spent a lot of time going to our residential schools over the years, and quite a lot of the activities we did were very deliberately uh, putting all students in the, in a place where none of them were expert, you know, and so they and they all had to struggle and find their way through, and doing that in a an environment which is in a sense pressured because you, you you've got a job to do got to get on with it and so on like that but also light-hearted less academic and so on is is i think a great way to get people uh, to engage and uh and do this it's very difficult to transfer that online um i have to say um so that that's the skill of, of being a, an online teacher is finding those sorts of activities where you can get people engaged by putting a you know relatively low barrier in there and also trying to defuse the um what they perceive as the the kind of judgment uh, levels of it um i have no recipe <laughs> right and, and for, from your presentation gabby that that you there's also the message like you have to respect that some people are less engaged uh, um does it also mean uh, implies that you never should reward students that are more engaged that again engagement should not be rewarded or so i could imagine that sometimes you have that with uh, in classrooms or so that that somehow students are benefiting or that they are showing off that they're more engaged and that influences their uh, grades um, but we have to respect on the other hand that others are less engaged i mean there is that um thing that some courses have where students will get a small amount of additional marks if they've participated in the discussion forum for example but those marks aren't necessarily going to mean pass or fail it's just um five percent or maximum ten percent or something um yeah i think i think that is um yeah, you're never going to be able to address everybody's um, needs, as we said. And you do want to encourage people. You want to find ways to encourage people. And I have found that in, in previous um, teaching contexts, it does make a difference if you give a, you know, add it to the assessment in some way, what students do on the discussion forum, because... Um, once they do start doing it, they they start to appreciate it and and learn the value of it. Um, so I wouldn't say don't reward students. I would just say don't make that a deal breaker in terms of pass or fail. No, clear. Thanks. Uh, one last question there from Fran. Thank you. Um, both presentations I found really, really, really interesting. We are um, Hibernia College is uh, we're based in Dublin, Ireland. Um, we're actually a blended college, so we have both face-to-face -face, um, and, and and online components. Our students are spread out around the country, so we've put a great deal of effort into online communities and um, make trying to make stu give students a sense of not being on their own, particularly when programs get difficult and, and so on. So a lot of the stuff that you, that you mentioned, Gabby, earlier few things that we found to be really successful, actually, I just, you know, and we're still obviously learning all the time, but the first two weeks of a program, we, we call the orientation um, and it's non-academic um, and it's about learning the tools that you're going to have on the program. It's about beginning the process of creating community between the students and it's having them complete some exercises which are non-academic. Non um, why do you want to do this program? What do you envisage yourself doing? Drawing pictures, sharing those pictures digitally and so on. We also put them into groups. So when day one, when they come in, they're part of a, a number of a small number of communities. Uh, we also provide all staff and students with, with a mobile app, with an app, a college app. Um, and one of the features of the app is that they can create their own groups. So students can create their own subgroups two, three, whatever, however, however they want. So we've experimented with a lot of a lot of different ways of trying to create a sense of community and and sustaining uh, sustaining that community over time. Um, and I, I just so I found that your, your talks really, really interesting and it's a massive challenge for us all. Um, and uh, it's it's really nice to be able to sort of hear uh, hear, hear of your experiences with this.
Thanks so much, uh, Fran, also. Um, that brings us to the closure of uh, today's session. Thanks again for Gabi, John, and Karen. And uh, I just want to announce that we have our next session in this webinar week on Thursday, and that is on immersive technologies starting at two o'clock, not half past one, but at two o'clock. And I hope to see you all there again. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone. See you Thursday. Bye. Bye. <laughs>